Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. However you may do that, you can go to jeffersonhour.com, click on donate, become an actual donor and supporter of the show. If that doesn't suit you, write us a letter. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Send in a question for President Jefferson or Professor Ellis or Professor Jenkinson, and uh, we'll try to answer it, which is what we do this week with Joe Ellis and Clay Jenkinson. I gathered up a bunch of our email. We got through about half of them, which is pretty good, and uh, started the conversation talking about uh, today's date, which is the 22nd of November, and we noted the uh, assassination of President Kennedy many years ago. You know, David, there are these moments that one remembers uh, where you were for the rest of your life. I suppose January 6th um, is now one of those dates, but uh, I think of the Challenger disaster. Uh, I think of uh, 9-11, of course. But for me, uh, the one that makes me choke in, uh, in, in grief and emotion every November 22nd uh, in other words, the the, 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 the severest for me of, of all those commemorative dates is uh, the assassination of John Kennedy. I was too young really to know what was going on, but I could sense in the response of my parents just uh, how monumental a moment that was. And I think as a historian, reading books about the, the aftermath, Vietnam, Nixon, Watergate, the revelations of the CIA, uh, the scandal, the, uh, the Iran-Contra scandal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just feels like if you were if you were drawing a map of the 20th century, there would be a number of lines of demarcation. But one of them certainly would be November 22nd, 1963. That's not the only thing we talk about on the show, although we do spend the first segment talking about that. And Joe volunteers some information about his own father, who was with the Secret Service. But then we go on to answer a number of questions, and I think you actually kept track of how many books of Joe's were mentioned during the conversation. Yeah, we mentioned seven of Joe Ellis's books. There are about double that and more coming. Um, and he's very, he's very gracious about all this, but if you ask him a question about why the British didn't crush the United States forces immediately in the summer of 1776. Joe can't help but say, well, I actually wrote a book about that called Revolutionary Summer. And if you talk about the changing attitudes towards Thomas Jefferson and race, Joe can't help but say, I wrote a book about that uh, recently in which we uh, assessed where Jefferson is now uh, and so on. Yeah, that's, why we, that's why we talk to him. Uh, he's written more about this period than anyone I know, and more interestingly about this period than anyone I know. Uh, his books have been of immense and fundamental importance to my formation as a, as a Jefferson scholar. And in addition to that, to think that such a person of such uh, extraordinary accomplishment uh, should be a friend of ours and a friend of this program uh, is a very humbling thing. Ditto on that. So let's go to the show. Um, before we go, uh, how are your online courses going, and how's registration for uh, uh, the, the, your next cultural tour? Yeah, a couple of things. So thanks for asking. The online course on the Constitution has been wonderful. I'm going to do it again um, probably in the late spring. The next online course uh, will be sometime early in the next year, uh, it's going to be on water in the West. You know, the West has run dry. There's talk of um, actually um, pulling down Glen Canyon Dam, Lake Powell. Um, California has is in a severe 20-plus year drought for the first time since uh, the Colorado River Compact in 1922. They're rationing the waters of the Colorado. There is a panic in the Southwest because the both with the over extension of the waters of the Colorado and other rivers, and because of global climate change, uh, we're heading towards a very severe distribution crisis in water. And so the next one will be on water in the West. Look for that on the website. There are a couple of places left for 
The Winter Encampment on Charles Dickens, if you're interested, uh, contact us immediately. Uh, that's at Locksaw Lodge, west of Missoula. Uh, and then Monterey, uh, our third John Steinbeck trip. Russ Eagle of North Carolina is writing a book about Steinbeck and his novella, Cannery Row. We tour all the great Steinbeck sites, including the museum in Salinas. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful cultural tour. And so if you're interested, now's the time to sign up. The summer trips are full, but you can get on a waiting list. Uh, so watch for all that. But the next online course, David, will be on water and the West. I actually did this at Locksaw Lodge a few years ago. And so I know the literature uh, really well, but there's there's a lot of new material on this. And, and at the time we last did this, uh, there was no fundamental water crisis in the West now there is. All right, sir. With that, shall we go to the show? Indeed, we should. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week, we are so pleased to welcome back one of our favorite guests, Mr. Joseph Ellis. I'm your host, David Swenson. We are also joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Now, we're recording this program on the 22nd of November, 2021, an auspicious date in American history. And Joe, the last time we talked to you, we talked about your new book, The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents. And this week, I have a number of listener questions for both you and Clay, but... Uh, Either of you like to comment on November 22nd? I want to ask Joe, uh, where were you on that day? Yeah, I was at the College of William and Mary, and I remember it has personal significance for me because my father was a Secret Service agent who, at the end of his career, was in charge of the delegation protecting the president. He died a year before Kennedy was assassinated, died of a massive heart attack at age 49. And a lot of people said, hey, if Joe were still alive, it wouldn't have happened, which of course is not true. But um, the Secret Service never quite recovered from that. Clint Hill, who was on the motorcade, he's in the famous photograph uh, when Mrs. Kennedy is is climbing back uh, out of the back seat of that limousine and he's credited with helping to save her life that day. Uh, he never got over this. He had a series of breakdowns and crises and alcoholism and so on. He's he's emerged more recently and written a couple of books about this subject. We actually had him here in North Dakota for an event on the 1960s. Um, and his view was, we could have been better, but we probably couldn't have prevented it. But the question I have to ask you is the obvious one, a uh, lone gunman or conspiracy of some sort? Um, I have a couple of his books in my library right here because they, the Secret Service sent them to me. Um, I harbored some reservations about the uh, judgment that a single person did it for a while. Um, I read a lot of stuff. Mailer has a book on this. Um, but I went to Dallas and I, and I went to the building and to the window that uh, the shots came from. And I walked away from there saying, yep, he could have done it by himself. It's not that hard a shot. And um, therefore, my conclusion is a single person did do it, and they and, that's, and Oswald was that person. I've been to Dealey Plaza, too, and I, I had the exact same reaction you did. But we should remember that the last official statement of the United States government was that it was a conspiracy. They said that it, the Senate looked at this in the 1980s and said that it was quite likely to have been a conspiracy of, of some sort. I have two quick follow-up questions before we get to David's long list of questions sent in by our listeners, because they're so uh, engaged by you, Joe, and they, they, they love it when you're on the show, and they, and they send in great questions, and they want you to answer them and, and me to be your lapdog. <laughs> but I have two quick follow-up questions. One is, how pivotal was that moment 
in what can now be described as the disenchantment and disillusionment of American life? Uh, I think that a lot of the members of, if I can put us in the same generation, Clay, always will think it was a pivotal moment, in part because of the kind of mythology that surrounds Camelot, that is the reconstruction of uh, JFK's presidency. I think, too, that it's kind of human nature to think that a person as insignificant as um, Oswald can't single-handedly be responsible for killing a man at, like Kennedy or causing such. I, I think the one issue on which I've given a lot of thought that relates is, would we have gotten out of Vietnam earlier? I think the answer to that is yes. I think Kennedy intended to get out after he was reelected, uh, and that could have made a significant difference. I think that the one shift that occurs at that time, or is in the process of occurring historically, is a fundamental shift in the attitude towards the question, do you trust the government of the United States? In 1960, the answer was 80% yes and 20% no. In 1970, the answer was 80% no and 20% yes, and it has never, has never changed since then. Whether that event solely was responsible is, un, is not completely true, but it was a part of that ma major shift. Second question is, um, without mentioning the word Richard Hofstetter, what is it about Americans that they love conspiracies as much as they do? I think there are two, well, two answers. One is that we don't l love it more than anybody else, that they're equally functional in other societies. Great Britain waged a war against us based on a conspiracy theory that we were plotting to revolt, which we weren't. There are all kinds of conspiracy theories in China and in, in uh, Russia and former Soviet Union. But I think democracies are more predisposed to conspiracy theories than other forms of government. Because democracies are dependent on popular opinion. And popular opinion as the founders, most especially Adams, but even Jefferson, would say are vulnerable to misinformation and to explanations that simplify com complex historical events. And that's part of the reason why they are successful on both sides of the political spectrum in American history. Fascinating. Uh, we couldn't pass over this historic day, the anniversary of, of an event I remember as if it were yesterday, the assassination. Where were you, Clay? I was in... Uh, first grade, and I was at Lincoln Elementary School in Dickinson, North Dakota, and used, back then you used to break for lunch and go home, walk home and come back. Uh, and when I got back, Ann Parsons, a fellow classmate of mine, blurted out, John Kennedy was killed in Texas just now, and nobody believed her. We just assumed that it was just some nonsense, and then an hour later they dismissed class uh, the school was dismissed, and we all went home. And I'll, and I'll just give you one more detail of that. You know, we had a little funky tube-type, smelly black and white television set with rabbit ears, and w we turned it on um, Friday. My father came home from work. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, and we watched. He watched the proceedings for the next three days. Uh, hardly leaving his chair, and it was the first time I ever saw him weep. Mm. Let me throw a final story in. It's a true story. Because of my father's job, when Kennedy was inaugurated in 1961, January, it was really cold, and he took me on the inaugural parade route the hour beforehand. And he was showing me off and uh, as his son, I think. I was... and. Um, I was a young kid and um, high school kid in the city of D.C. and and uh, I just remember it was so cold. And but I remember him saying, um, "You know, we know how to protect the president, but we can't stop people who are crazy and who don't care about their own lives." And 
we try, but that's hard. I remember him saying that. This is while he's crawling up on the to seal the manhole covers and the snipers on the roof and stuff like that. But uh, he turned out to be right. And that's what uh, John Kennedy said in in Fort Worth and Dallas that very day. He he told Jackie Kennedy, you know, any nut who really wants to get me or any president can. Well, just to preempt us from getting mail, um, because we will, because, you know, I think the vast majority of Americans today still believe that there was a conspiracy. There, I mean, and for anybody to say for certain what happened that day, that's not a road I want to go down. There's a lot of evidence that Oswald was uh, involved with American intelligence. You know, you talk about 80% of the people not trusting the government. Well, the Warren report just by omission caused a lot of that. But you know, my experience was very much like Clay's, although I'm a couple of years older. I will never forget being the only one up watching that little tiny black and white TV and seeing uh, Oswald get shot live on television and, you know, running around my house and waking my parents and getting them to, you know, come to the television. And it was certainly a pivotal moment. And I think America would be far different had it not occurred. Look, we don't know, right? The Warren Commission report was inadequate. Uh, and it was, I think, an honest attempt to create a narrative that would close the books on this question and allow the nation to go on. LBJ was worried that if the Soviets somehow were found to be behind it, it could lead to World War III. There was a lot of desire to, to build a, a narrative that, that, that put an end to this, and the Warren Commission worked valiantly in order to do so. But almost immediately, within weeks of its issuance, the American people rejected it. Uh, they, wh Whatever the truth is about what happened that day in Dallas, the American people did not accept uh, the Warren Commission report. And the skepticism has grown over time. As you said earlier, David, the United States Congress investigating this in the 1980s uh, determined that they their best view was that there probably was some sort of a conspiracy. I've been to Dealey Plaza myself, and I certainly get it that it was a possible shot for Lee Harvey Oswald, but I believe that it was a conspiracy, and I'm not quite sure what that conspiracy consisted of. And I keep hoping that someone who's now 98 years old will, on his deathbed, uh, reveal what he knows, or she, uh, but that doesn't appear that that's going to happen. This is going to... Well, actually, it's already happened two or three times, so it's, who do you believe? It's what, yeah, so I've, I, we've heard people make claims, but none has been solid enough to be widely accepted. I think this will be a mystery as long as there is human history. With that, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, gentlemen, I promise I shall present you with some very interesting questions from our listeners. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Our favorite, Joseph Ellis, still at an undisclosed location in the Green Mountains of Vermont. Who knows where he really is? It's a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, I'm really in the Soviet Union. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> I want to tie this back to Jefferson for just a moment. Say what you wish about John Fitzgerald Kennedy and his dependence on Ted Sorensen and so on and so forth. When he, um, and every, everyone who dabbles in American history and Jefferson knows this story, that when he hosted a, a White House dinner for Nobel Prize laureates, yeah. uh, yes. he traveled out of his text. Uh, in other words, he didn't just read what had been prepared for him by his staff, and he looked out at this group of extraordinary people, and he said, never has so much intellect, so much talent been gathered into this place, except possibly when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Great line, isn't it? He really did come up with that himself, too. Yes, I've seen it in the National Archives, and there, penciled in, he wrote that witticism. And so what Kennedy had was what we call elan, a kind of elegant, witty uh, presence of mind to, to, to speak in, in a really thoughtful way. And even though he may not have written all of his own books, 
Um, he was very well educated, and he must have had a notebook somewhere of of uh, extraordinary things that have been said by extraordinary people, because he was able to quote Bertrand Russell or Winston Churchill or Marcus Aurelius, for that matter, almost at will. And that really marks him as possibly the most witty. Um, and I don't, I, with wit, I don't just mean like a quip, but, but the sort of wit as, as of having extraordinary presence of mind, um, maybe more than any other president. I don't disagree. Um, I will tell you that the, quote, historiography, that is the work of historians of the last 50 years, on the Kennedy presidency has done a lot to um, undermine the somewhat legendary version of Camelot, which is really Jacqueline Kennedy's creation, and to um, suggest that he was not as great a president as you might expect. Um, Popular assessments of former presidents. There are two kinds of ratings. One is scholarly of political scientists and historians, and the other is more is a measure of popular opinion, not uh, scholarly opinion. In the popular race, Kennedy comes out among recent presidents, comes out first or second. First or second, one that they change places is Kennedy and Reagan. In the scholarly opinion, he's in the middle of the pack. That is to say, he's like uh, 30th. And and so the scholarly opinion of him is less pronounced than than the modern opinion. Well, let's move on to a letter. It's about one of your books, Professor Ellis, your many books, Professor Ellis. Ah, yes. It's from Chris Luvisi, and he says, in reading... Professor Ellis's American creation, he referenced a three-day meeting at Mount Vernon held prior to the Constitutional Convention. I'd love to learn more details about these three fateful days in November of 1786. Is there a book you might recommend? Uh, Yes, and I happen to have written it. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not in the current book. It's a book that I wrote a couple of years earlier called the quartet Uh, subtitle is um, the American it's the the creation of the second American. I see the constitutional convention as a fundamental shift from the values of the declaration. It's there's two foundings. One we declare our independence and the other one we declare our nationhood. But the meeting that the writer refers to is a meeting in which Madison and Washington and Hamilton plot what becomes a benevolent coup d'etat, namely the calling of a constitutional convention later in the year to allegedly revise but secretly replace the government under the Articles of Confederation. It really requires a coup because there is no groundswell, there's no popular sense that we need to change the government, but from the above, uh, especially Washington, uh, Jay's in there too, Uh, Hamilton, believe that the true meaning of the American Revolution must be nationhood. And they impose that, and the result is the Constitutional Convention. Right. So I I agree with you, and I recommend to all of our listeners the quartet. I mean, I always love to say there's no question that David can put to you in which you don't say, oh, yeah, I've written a book about that. But (laughs) but be that that as it may. but um, yeah, this is one. I, I wish I'm the quartet. I wish I had maybe a different title now. I don't know. It's uh, the four people that the quartet refers to are Washington, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, and three of them become the editors of the Federalist Papers after the convention. I think what mostly they were doing at that meeting at Mount Vernon was putting on a full court press to persuade Washington to attend because he was so reluctant to attend. He feared that he would jeopardize his reputation as the American Cincinnatus, that he would be regarded as a man of ambition, a man who broke his sacred vow, that coming out of retirement could not possibly do him any good and probably a great deal of ill, and that it would be much better if he just stayed, as he put it, under his vine and his fig tree 
at Mount Vernon and finished out his life as a private citizen, but uh, the sense of urgency by Hamilton particularly and Madison and others that he must attend. They, what they said is if you don't do it, it won't work. That you lend a level of the legitimacy and credibility to the effort, which if it doesn't have that, it has no chance in succeeding. Washington's aides were at the time saying, don't do it because if you do it and it fails, it will forever stain your legacy. But even more so, if you do it and it succeeds, you will be drafted inevitably to be the first president. And the truth is no president in American history did not want to be president more than George Washington. He wasn't kidding. He wasn't being coy. He really didn't want to be president. He, when, the, when he took the inaugural trip up to what was the capital then, New York, he said, I feel as if I'm going to my own execution. To the gallows. But, but Joe, yeah. uh, yes, I, I think that's true of Washington. But Madison and Hamilton turned the tables on that very argument and said, if you don't go and the system collapses, this will in some sense be on you because if you do go, you can help bring credibility to the thing and there's a chance that we might uh, survive and form a more perfect union. So not coming would be an act of disrespect to all the things that you have spent your life fighting for. And so poor Washington was eventually worn down and he reluctantly agreed to go. And as you say, he was immediately made the president of the convention. It was absolutely clear to everyone in that room that he would be the first president or whatever uh, executive they determined. Um, and they assumed, many of them, including Jefferson, that he would serve for life uh, right. once he was uh, appointed at the end of the convention. So talk about changing the trajectory of someone's life. Um, he, it's hard to imagine those last years of Washington just living quietly at Mount Vernon. Hard for us to imagine, but it was very easy for him to imagine that. That question comes from Chris Luvisi, who lives in Cohasset, Massachusetts. Uh, and he ends his letter by thanking the both of you for such informative dialogue. He says, you provide a national service in my view. I want to thank him for that, but I just want you to know, I never realized until now how much Hamiltonian history that our leading Jeffersonian, namely Clay Jenkinson, actually also possesses because what he got through said is exactly right. <laughs> Joe, thank you. I, I need to confess to you, Joe, you may not have no learned this, but and it's for me, it's almost, almost the deepest humiliation I can possibly offer here today. <laughs> I was in London recently with my daughter, Catherine. She's a student. Um, in graduate studies at Oxford, and we attended nothing but Hamilton. <laughs> I want to move on to another book question. This comes from Daryl Burke, and you sort of walked into it because he says he read Chernow's book on George Washington. And the book says the British had multiple opportunities to crush Washington's army. Why didn't they? Let me start because I can say, hey, Joe wrote a book about that. <laughs> True. I wrote a book about that, too. He did. It's the summer of the summer of 1776. It, it's a brilliant book about what happened uh, on Long Island and in Manhattan. So uh, there's that. Let me, But before you answer the question, Joe, let me ask a, a, a much briefer question. What's the worst thing that can be said of Ron Chernow except that his books are long? Chernow writes epics. I tend to write sonnets. But it, his, it's, his biography of Washington is very detailed. It's 880-some pages long. Um, mine is like 350 pages of my biography. But the answer to the question is that the British Army did have a very real opportunity to potentially end the American Revolution and the war at the very start in the battle for Long Island and Manhattan. But the reason that didn't happen is that the commander of the British Army was William Howe. And Howe and his brother, uh, Richard Howe, were both really not believers in the war. They thought it was misguided and that their job was to come over and deliver a stiff blow to the arm, the Continental Army, convince them that that it was a worthless cause, and then join hands with them and, 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 and as peace commissioners uh, end this senseless conflict. 
But the opportunities to annihilate the Continental Army came up three times during the summer of 76, and at each time, Howe stepped back and didn't do it. For those of you who are keeping score at home, the book I refer to is Joseph J. Ellis' Revolutionary Summer, The Birth of American Independence. It's a wonderful read about this very question that the British, with the largest navy in the world, having sent twenty or 30,000 troops to the New World, had it in their power to crush the revolution immediately. Washington hadn't yet learned a Fabian strategy, that is, avoiding pitched battles. He made a lot of mistakes. He was not a great military strategist, at least at that point in yeah, his he, he career. He had an honor-driven sense of war, which was like, if you're challenged to duel, you are honor-bound to respond. If you think about it, how many wars did Great Britain lose between 1750 and 1950? One. So it's incredible uh, that this bumbling group of amateurs, and they were amateurs, soldiers, was able to, in the end, they didn't win, the British just lost. Or the Brit British would say they didn't lose, they just decided to cut their losses. You really detail that in, uh, in your latest book, The Cause. I've got another book question from Mr. Burke. After reading John Adams by McCullough, he seems as accomplished and less flawed, that is Adams, than Jefferson, but no national statues, etc. Let me say, first of all, that certainly the argument can be made that Jefferson's flaws, because they're so deep, I mean, he's a racist, he's an apartheidist, he's a hypocrite. Those flaws are so obvious to us now, and particularly with our sensitivity to race, that we're having a very hard time with Jefferson. And Adams is an abolitionist. Uh, he never was uh, capable of those sort of inconsistencies. In fact, he wore his mind and his heart on his sleeve. And so when Adams says something, uh, we can always know that that's exactly what Adams thinks. Secondly, and I think equally important, and this is what, how I would toss it back to Joe Ellis, Jefferson was an 18th century gentleman in the highest sense of that term, a man of elegance, of manners, of exquisite sensibility, uh, a kind of a character out of a Jane Austen novel with perfect gentlemanly deportment. And already America was moving in a different direction from that. It was moving towards a rawer, more earthy, more honest, more populist, less a mannered sensibility. And Adams is kind of a transitionary figure. He has all the capacity to do what Jefferson did. He just doesn't have the character to do it. And so he rises in our estimation because he seems authentic, while now Jefferson diminishes in, in our estimation because he seems a little artificial. And so it's a bit unfair, but uh, certainly well, Adams Let me is get in here, Clay. That is, I agree with what you're saying, and you've delivered a pretty harsh criticism of Jefferson. I'm afraid that most of it, all of it is true. But there's a single reason why there's a memorial to Jefferson on the mall, and there isn't one for Adams. And that is Jefferson wrote the magic words of American history that begin, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Those are the most important words ever written by any American ever. And there's a reason why he put them on his tombstone first. He didn't put president or anything, uh, or secretary of state or anything, or Louisiana Purchase. There's a second reason, and that is that in part because of my efforts, but not so solely at any chance, I think we're, we have over the last 30, 40, 50 years come to realize that the founders were not demigods. Uh, what did Emerson say? He was the next generation. He said, they saw God face to face. We can only see him secondhand. All new nations seem to need mythical heroes, capitalized and mythologized founding fathers. And at some point in time, like a kid, you realize your parents really are imperfect. And in this case, our national, our historical parents were all human beings like us. And Adams is the guy who is the most conspicuously imperfect because he tells you so and because he's got a diary that keeps telling you so. And so we're hungry for people who are more human than godlike, and Adams is in that category. 
Um, that said, despite the fact that scholarly opinion has shifted in the direction that Clay suggests, there still is no monument to Mount to Adams on the Mall or the Tidal Basin. Um, I testified with uh, uh, David McCulloch before several subcommittees, and I said that we need to have an Adams Memorial on the Tidal Basin close to the Jefferson Memorial, situated in such a location that they, depending on the angle of the sun and the time of the day, turns casting shadows over each other's facades. I thought that was a great idea, but nobody else seemed to think it had any relevance at all. And uh, there's still, uh, you know, there's nothing for, and what David thought, which I thought was a great idea, by the way, David is not well right now. Um, and we should put him in our prayers. Um, uh, what David McCulloch said was that they should build an Adams Memorial somewhere on the mall that was in the form of a library. And that wasn't a traditional, and it, and, um, and that it would be a place where you go to read books as more than just, um, you know, just have momentary glimpses of, of a monument. And um, I thought that was a good idea, too. Uh, in some sense, Adams is, he's not on the mall, but close. The, the, um, there is an Adams branch and a Madison branch of the, uh, of the, you know, the library, the federal library there. And, um, but um, my point is, there's a single reason why Jefferson is remembered, and there is a new reason why Adams is becoming more fashionable. Clay, you missed your setup. Uh, by the way, Joe wrote a book about. Oh yes, I was. I've, too. I have. I have three quick things to say. But with that, we need to take a short break. When we come back, uh, I have a, a question about. Uh, well, the statues of Jefferson being removed, and and uh, uh. Uh, how long before the Jefferson Hour is is uh, is targeted? So we'll save that for our next segment. Ah. Uh. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour with Joseph Ellis. Always a beautiful pleasure to have the attention of one of the great historians of our time who apparently has written a book on every possible listener question. Uh, Joe... Uh, Let me summarize it this way. John Adams spent his life telling us what he thought we needed to hear. Thomas Jefferson gave his life telling us what we wanted to hear. That's close. I've said something like that in places. I've said Jefferson tells us what we want to hear. Adams tells us what we need to know. So second thing, there is a monument to John Adams in Washington, D.C. There's a small plaque in the White House where he said, let only honest, uh, virtuous, and so on people reside here. And so that's sort of what he's going to get, I think. If there were that monument you have in mind near the Tidal Basin, and there was a statue of your man John Adams glaring across at Jefferson, it would be like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Yeah, and, and, and Adams wanted to be Sancho Panza. He did. He said that, which is itself another reason I love the guy. Let me read the question to the both of you. It comes from Edward Stewart. In all seriousness, how long before your show about Jefferson is considered hate and protest against you really ramps up? That statue of Jefferson voted to be removed in New York really concerns me. We need the Jefferson mind more than ever, in my opinion. I uh, know what he's referring to is that the government, the New York State government in Albany, uh, voted to remove him. There was a big debate about it. It wasn't uh, overwhelming. I've been asked in other venues about this, and I said I spoke to Jefferson about this, and that he told me he was relieved to be removed from the corruption of Albany. <laughs> But uh, I think the, the most recent instance is that they are removing his statue from City Hall in New York City. Let me go to the second part of the question. How long can the Jefferson Hour survive without being canceled? Good question. I agonize over this, frankly. Uh, not that Jefferson himself 
is in any danger. We need Jefferson, for the, if only for the reasons that Joe says, that he launched the most important sentence, maybe in the history of human liberty, but certainly in the history of the United States. He's indispensable for that. And it's not just a sentence. Any number of people could have written something like that, but Jefferson had a certain capacity with his pen that is unique. The only, the second or first best writer as president was Abraham Lincoln. The second uh, or first best writer was Thomas Jefferson. So he's in no significant danger in the long run. This wave, he would say, always using his his favorite a metaphor of, of, of ships of state. He would say, this wave will pass and our Argosy, because it is so well built, will survive and we will make port uh, in the long run and so on. I think he's absolutely right. But I think there's going to be uh, a removal of a lot of statues. I think that a lot of places with uh, his name on them are going to change that name. I think he's going to be on the cross here for a while longer. Um, and it certainly, I think, represents a permanent any historian should be careful of saying that, but it represents a permanent demotion of Jefferson in American memory, uh, I think without question. And the, I agonize over this with the Jefferson Hour because the Jefferson Hour is not, I think everyone kind of gets it, it's not fundamentally about Jefferson. It's about the world Jefferson envisioned and how well we're doing. And so uh, it's, it's complicated, and, and I, I believe that, the, the, that there will be stations uh, that cancel the program, and I believe that there will be individuals who refuse to listen just because, for them, uh, Jefferson is toxic. And I think that's a terrible mistake, but um, it's not for us to decide. But let me offer a historical perspective of the place where we're at with regard to these kind of questions about monuments and founders and Jefferson versus Adams, et cetera, and that is there's a debate going on about control of the American narrative. And there are two cartoons, meaning I, I find them to be simplistic, unacceptably silly views. One is that the founders were all demigods and American history is this American exceptionalism, is America is a set, you know, God looks, take, takes care of America. And the other side is that the founders are the deadest, whitest males in American history. And the American Revolution created patriarchy, racism, and imperialism. So that there's a pro-American and an anti-American view. And in the, in the academy, in many of the very distinguished colleges and universities, the anti-American view is right now hegemonic. I think both of those perspectives are silly and almost adolescent. The American narrative is morally... There's no, there's no moralistic version that will work. Its triumphs and its tragedies are interconnected. The same nation that failed to end slavery fought the bloodiest war in its history based on the principles declared in the American Revolution. And the same principles that people on the left are now using in the kind of uh, arguments they're making about racism they don't understand that those very values come right out of the revolution and out of Jefferson. So I think we're going to move over time to a more mature understanding. Now, some of the, I mean, I think the issue of the Confederate flag and um, people like Robert E. Lee, those become tricky because in the end, the Civil War was about slavery. Five generations of white Southerners have grown up with the notion that that's not true, but they're living a lie on that. It was about slavery, but on the revolution, the notion that the American Revolution was really a horrible failure uh, and just generated all those things, like I mentioned earlier, slavery, patriarchy, etc., that is a fundamental distortion of the of the historical evidence. Um, and uh, Jefferson stands in the middle of the values that um, are the most eternally significant in the history of the human race. I say this carefully, Joe. I, I don't think that your book, American Sphinx, if it were a dissertation, could get approved at Columbia or Yale today because of the politicization of the humanities and their distaste uh -huh. for such um, generous accounts as you have given. You're not at all easy on Jefferson. Uh, no, that's what I was going to say. It's hardly a kind of, uh, 
you know, prayer to Jefferson, it's got critical, it's a, it's a critical assessment of Jefferson's personality, I would think. But I you're could, saying that, that the ideological forces are so sweeping that that would get swept away too. I'm saying exactly that. Um, we, we would be remiss if we didn't say at this very moment, you've written a book about this too, American Dialogue, The Founders and Us. And, and, and in that book, you are harder on Jefferson than you ever had been previously in your historiography. Uh, mm -hmm. That's because the only prism of looking through at that particular chapter is race. Right. So you, at, at this point in your distinguished career, looking back on all your work um, and, and, and turning to, to where we are with respect to the founders today, uh, you were, I would say, sternly critical of Jefferson in a way that would have astonished you, I think, when you wrote American Sphinx. I know what you're saying, Clay, perhaps self-protectively. I don't really agree. I think that the, 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 the sections in American Sphinx that deal with race are pretty critical, too. But um, the, the, the first book, that is American Sphinx, is a whole biography. And so many facets of Jefferson's personality and life. Whereas the article in, um, in the essay in American Dialogue is exclusively about Jefferson and race. And any time you look only through that, that pane of the window back to the past, Jefferson is not going to look very good. And I knew that in 1975 or whatever year I wrote American Dialogue. I guess it's later than that. But, um, but I, but I understand why you're saying that because it's not what you're saying is plausible. But it, to me, it's not completely true. Can I ask the both of you about a, another historical figure from that era whose reputation is not very good? This is a letter from Case Brugan, and he drew my attention to a podcast uh, a guy named Dan Snow hosts. Two British guys. The other being Andrew Roberts, who is an English historian and journalist, he has a new book out called The Last King of America, The Misunderstood Reign of George III. And in this podcast, they kind of go point by point through the Declaration of Independence. Andrew Roberts says that most of it is complete nonsense, that Jefferson was, quote, the great propagandist great writer of all time, great thinker of all time, pretty useful president, but the Declaration of Independence is just a bit bonkers. Well, the Brits can't get over the fact that they lost a war. <laughs> and and um, Jefferson was assigned the duty of being the prosecuting attorney to uh, draft the indictment of the British king because at that moment, the colonists had re rejected Parliament's authority, but that they had yet to reject the authority of the king, George III. They had claimed that he would rescue them, that he would see the truth. He was not aware of what his ministers were doing, um, and that, that, that they had to kill the king if they were going to move towards independence, and Jefferson was given that mission. And he did it about as well as it could possibly be done. And it seems to me that um, I got some British critics of my recent book because I'm tough on George the Third. There, and I'm saying in the end he's the person who forced the Brit Great Britain to make the greatest mistake in the history of British statecraft, namely to walk themselves into a war that turned out to be unwinnable um, and lose the North American part of its empire. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, the Brits, uh, still think they could have won the war <laughs> if they just held on longer. There's many British historians have written books saying that, and, uh, I think they're deluding themselves. Um, but, um, uh, George the third is the guy who forced the, the happening of the American Revolution. It wouldn't have happened without him. And, um, and it was, the, you know, it was the biggest mistake, as I say, in the history of British statecraft. Well, he had a lot of help pointing him in that direction. I've read that in your books. Yeah, he did. He did. But as, as it became clear 
that this was going to be a long and potentially disastrous war. He's the guy who refused to back off. And even when the French come into the war in 1778, and it becomes almost impossible for the Brits to win then because they've got to spread the resources throughout the British Empire to defend against France. He still insists, and the war keeps going on for three years and four years that it shouldn't have. And um, they should have gotten out then. Um, everybody that died between 78 and 80, 83 didn't need to die. Um, but um, uh, I, I'm not saying that George III was an inherently evil person. Um, uh, I'm saying that we should recognize why Britain and why George III made the mistakes they did. I mean, think of it this way, a newly arrived world power brimming over with confidence, sure of its own military and economic supremacy, steps into an unwinnable war. That should sound pretty familiar. <laughs> Joe, a couple of things about that. First of all, George III is one of the minor heroes of the musical Hamilton. He's just absolutely splendid in it. But uh, I think this is what should have happened. The British should have followed Burke and Pitt. They should have stepped back and said, look, look right. the colonies are sort of a unique problem. Uh, they're highly sophisticated. They're a very, very long way from London. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to win any war with them. How much do we need to give here? How much do we need to concede to this right. American cause in order to shut them up and satisfy them and continue? And if they had done that, if they had simply said, what's it going to take for you to calm down and for us to continue, uh, I think the war would have been unnecessary. I think in the end, we would have developed a Commonwealth system very much like the one that eventually came about with Canada and Australia and New Zealand and other places still uh, nominally under the crown, but independent in terms of their self-government. In fact, Jefferson had, had even posited a Commonwealth view uh, a couple of years before the war actually happened. And so the British, by getting stubborn, and here I say that was George III, not alone, but that was George III, that stubbornness and oh, you refusal. Know, you ought to read this book to cause, because that's exactly what it says. That's um, where I learned this. And uh, I think the leading thinker on this wasn't Jefferson on the Commonwealth idea, it was Franklin. And, uh, uh, and in effect, by the time you get to 78, the Brits send over a commission, the Carlisle Commission, say, we'll give you everything you asked for back in 75, 76. Um, you can govern yourself as long as you remain part of the empire economically. But by then, it's too late. Too many people have died. Too many women have been raped. Too many American towns and cities have been burned to the ground. Um, uh, and George III, you know, again, it should sound familiar. He thinks he's he's in he's the one of the originators of what came to be called under Eisenhower the domino theory. If we lose North America, we are, we're going to lose Canada. Then we're going to lose Jamaica, and then we're going to lose maybe even India. And it's this notion that that that's, that's sort of the credibility theory that we have to maintain a credible presence, and we can't make any concessions at all. Because once you make that any concession, then the, the whole the whole empire starts to crumble. That's that was wrong, and it was wrong for the United States in Vietnam, and it was wrong for Britain in uh, in the, the 18th century. Uh, but that it's a, it's understandable that they think that way, though. We're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. We're out of time for this week. It just flew by. Um, we are recording this on the 22nd of November. It's not going to broadcast for about 10 days, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to wish people a a happy Thanksgiving, even if it's a little late, Joe. Please be safe, travel safely, and truly thank the world for the fact that you live in the United States, even though we're going through a very, very difficult time. Give thanks. I agree, David. And I was going to say it's time to wrap up this program because we've now mentioned seven of Joe's books. <laughs> um, I think there's a seven-book limit. If sales don't go up, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> well, Christmas is coming. I, I just want to add one thing at the end. I've always been talking to you with two dogs behind me. Now there's only one. Oh. Amy went to the hereafter a week ago. Oh. She was 16 years old, 
And all of our listeners who own dogs can understand that even though we took care of her till the very end, it's really tough emotionally. And uh, I thank you for giving me an occasion to put my mind elsewhere. What, what, what was your dog's name? Phoebe. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's Phoebe a... was a 16-year-old Labradoodle. Yeah, and I, you know, there, there was a certain quiet this week, and uh, now we know why. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> and you have my sincere sympathies, sir. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.